awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his many acts, or his mighty acts, and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all of the generations. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up those who are bowed down. And the eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you have given them their food in their due season. You open your hand, and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways, gracious in all of his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth, and he will fulfill the desires of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who, he, who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall speak of the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. Well, this psalm starts off and ends with this great statement. It is a praise of David, and it ends, My mouth shall speak of the praise of the Lord. So this is a song of praise. From beginning to end, this psalm will celebrate uh, the goodness and the greatness of our God. And so this, this psalm was so highly regarded by the Hebrews that they said whoever uttered this psalm by tongue or by heart uh, three times a day would be a happy person. And as you think about that, I mean, if we go through the day and we realize, you know what, my, my soul is downcast, I'm really struggling today, come back and read this psalm. See if it doesn't pick your spirits up, lift you up. This is a great psalm because it starts off a praise of David. As we go through this psalm, I want you to understand and ask yourself, how is it that David can say these words? As the king of Israel, how could he say this is a psalm, a psalm of praise? And how could he make these great statements about God? And ask yourself, do you have such a view and such a, a, a position or an opinion of God? In verses 1 through 2, it says, I will extol you, O my God, O king. And then he says, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. And so David comes to us. He teaches us this critical truth that we as Christians need to get within our core. David tells us that we need to praise God daily, continually. Throughout the day, throughout all the day, throughout all your life, we need to learn to praise God. I mean, think about, you know, think about it this way. Why did God create us? He created us for one purpose, to praise Him. And if we're neglecting that area in our life on a habitual, continual basis, you're not fulfilling the purpose from which God created you. He created us for this one purpose, to praise Him. I mean, have you ever really sat down and thought about it and, and just asked the question, why are you here? And the simple answer is to praise God. And so this is why, for example, evolutionary thinking is so dangerous. Evolutionary thinking uh, teaches that we're just a cosmic accident. We're just the result of you know, molecules randomly bumping into each other. Evolution teaches us that we, you are here and there is no purpose for your life. Now, you don't think that has detrimental consequences, especially when our children are being you know, bombarded, Christian children are being bombarded day after day with that kind of nonsense? You're just an accident. You're an advanced orangutan. You have no purpose. What kind of consequences will that have on a society? Just go out there and look around. Look at our children today. And so as a result of this false theory, many have been, millions have been deceived, especially within the church. So when people are deceived, when people are indoctrinated into thinking there's no purpose for life, then they will not praise God for His great acts of creation and His great acts of redemption. And as we go through this, what happens to a nation when it refuses to praise their Creator? Well, then the prophecy that David gives at the very end of this psalm, verse 21, where it says, All flesh shall bless His holy name forever and ever. When we embrace such a um, horrible view of creation, such as we're just an accident here, and if we think we're here created, or we're uncreated, we're just an accident, we have no purpose, we're not here to praise God, then this prophecy doesn't take place in our lifetime. As we look at this exhortation from David, does this characterize our lives sitting here this evening? 
when we think about ourselves, when we think about our purpose for life, then what do you actually think about? What are you giving yourself to? What do you spend most of your time doing and talking about? Whatever that is, that's the center of your life. Now what each of us has to do is compare our lives with the Word of God. And whenever we find misalignments with our focus, our purpose, then we need to repent and we need to begin to align ourselves with the Word of God. And this is what David is trying to help us do here. Now notice what he says, I'll extol you my God. Now notice this phrase, my God. Whenever it's used in the Psalms, it refers to a personal relationship. And David throughout his life had this kind of relationship with his God. Even from his birth. Turn over to uh, Psalm 22 real quick. Just hold your place here. We'll come right back. No, notice what David says, even from his birth. Psalm 22 and verse 9. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me to trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. I mean, this should be our desire for our children, right? Our desire is that our children from a young age would have God as their God and that they would know Him. And so here we see the motive for praising God, don't we? We praise Him because He is our God. Have you personalized this? I am praising Him because I want to be close to Him. I want to please Him. I want to praise Him to advance the relationship that I have with Him. Has your relationship gotten stagnant with God? Then praise Him. Make Him your God. Children, it can't be He's the God of your father and your mother. He has to be your God. And so if your relationship has become stagnant, you, your relationship with God has not advanced in quite some time, then praise Him. When we get together to sing praises to His name, sing, praise Him, thank Him. When you have opportunities to tell others about His goodness, His greatness, His kindness, His long-suffering, His mercy, His grace, do it. Advance the relationship that you have with God. When we have time tomorrow, make yourselves available. Whenever we have time to gather together to praise God, make yourselves available to praise God. And if you can't make yourself available here, then do it at home. Do it at work. And so we see our motive for praising God. And notice the majestic title that he gives God. I will extol you, my God, O King. David says that my God is a king. Now what's interesting about this is David is a king. And David, as the king of Israel, recognizes that there is a power higher than him. Do you? Do you recognize that there's an authority over you? The king of Israel did. This teaches me that ultimate authority is not from man, but from God himself. And what made Israel so great um, under the rule of David was that David, as king, understood that there was only one authority over him. He understood that the laws of the land should be based upon the principles set forth by this great king, which was his God. And here's, here's a thing we need to be praying for. As we gather this evening to pray, we need to pray for wise rulers. We need to keep pressing this point because, uh, unfortunately, many within the church have just abandoned this principle. And as a result, we're just content as a nation with godless rulers. And what we need to remember is that the source of the laws within the nation is the God of that nation. And so it should be obvious that uh, the kinds of immorality, the kinds of immoral laws that are being passed today demonstrate that the triune God of the Scriptures is no longer the God of this nation. The unbeliever does not have a problem with imposing their morality on us. And so we as the pe people of God need to get comfortable pressing the crown rights of Christ upon our culture and uh, showing the blessings and the wisdom of God's rule. You ever get embarrassed when you're talking to the unbeliever and he talks about something about your God or Christ? You get a little embarrassed? Don't be embarrassed. You press the crown rights of Christ Jesus. His laws, His ways are holy, just, and good always. Whatever He does is right. Whatever He does is good. And we need to remember that as Christians, we have an infinitely wise, infinitely good, infinitely just God who gives us good, wise laws. And so as Christ not only brings salvation, Christ transforms cultures. He brings liberty to cultures. And uh, we have forgotten as a people that as long as our land submitted to Christ, 
we had freedoms, we had liberties unknown to any other nation in the world. We don't know what it looks like because we don't remember what it was like. We, we haven't seen it in quite some time. I mean, you just think about even some of our patriotic songs that we used to sing. Do you remember the last stanza? You remember? I don't know if you kids know this uh, patriotic song, My Country Tis of Thee. In the very last stanza, it says, Our Father's God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. You know, there was a point here in this land where we were not embarrassed to call our God our King. And at one point, we were the most moral and just nation on the earth, and dignitaries used to send ambassadors over here to go understand what in the world is it about this land that prospers so well. It's that we submitted to our King. We experienced blessings and prosperity unlike any other nation. We at one time acknowledged the sovereignty and the power of our Almighty King, which is the triune God of the Scriptures, and blessings abounded uh, upon this land, and blessings will abound when we're not ashamed to call God our great King. So where are these godly leaders? I, mean, I don't know if you remember, but back in Alabama years, a few years ago, uh, the thing that got Roy Moore in trouble, if you remember him, what got him in trouble was that he was not afraid from his position as a judge to proclaim the source of law in America was God in Jesus Christ. That's what got him in trouble. But his position was not tolerated by the federal system and it certainly wasn't tolerated by the media. And Christians just stood back. And so we need to reclaim this position outlined by David here. God is our God. We need to personalize it. But we need to remind everyone God is our King. I look at verse 3. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and His greatness is unsearchable. Is there a word in this passage that stands out to you? He's great. Do you believe it? Lord here, all capitalized, is Jehovah. David wants us to know that Jehovah is great. His greatness is unsearchable. When I think about unsearchable, I'm thinking about unfathomable. It's immeasurable. It cannot be exhaustively uh, exhaustively understood. David is saying the universe can't even contain his greatness. And so as you study it out, as you study out who God is, have you come to the place where you get a sense of the immensity of God, his greatness, and his power? Does the greatness of God give you a sense of joy? Does it give you a sense of satisfaction when you hear these things? Because without a sense of the greatness of God, we have not properly honored and praised the living God tell you that one again if we have not properly honored God and praised the living God with just this sense of greatness we, we haven't done it we haven't praised him we haven't honored him correctly and here's what Je David wants you to understand and this is what's so great about David David gets this but you know what David didn't keep it hidden to himself he didn't get these truths and just keep it to himself look what he says in verse 4 one generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts God will always have a people who will praise Him for His work. We will praise Him for His righteousness. We will praise Him for His goodness. We will praise Him for His generosity, His compassion, His wisdom, His patience. Is there anyone in here who cannot say, I'm glad that my God is patient with me? Hmm. We ought to praise Him for it. There will always be someone on the earth to praise God. And here's the question for us as an assembly. Are we such a people? Are we such a people? Are we a people who look for ways to praise and honor our God? And if we are, then it is our duty to pass the great works of God from one generation to the next. We do this so the next generation will praise God. We teach the next generation the mighty works of God. Why? So they'll know who they're praising. They'll know how to praise Him. Now, here's the problem with many within the church today. They don't know the mighty acts of God, so they, they don't praise Him. And as a result, they don't teach the next generation. Remember, you can't teach what you don't know. You can't pass along what you don't have. So here's the question for us here this evening. How are we influencing the next generation? Do we have a multi-generational view for our children? So as Christians, do we understand that we are here living for the future? And part of that future is to point the next generation to the great God of the Scriptures. This great is the Lord, greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. How are you doing with this? The people around you, do your children know you serve a great God? 
We need to teach them the triumph of God's grace within our own lives. We need to show them from history how God moves and brings light into darkness. And as Christians, we must be thinking about the future and how we can influence future generations because this, you know, quite frankly, this is how David was thinking. This is how David thought. Hold your place here. Turn back over to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Verse 1, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. And we will not hide them from our children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. For He has established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they might arise and declare them to their children, that they may set up their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. David says, I'm going to teach you some things that my daddy taught me. So, Here's a question and challenge for us. Are we teaching our children to be more courageous than us? More knowledgeable than us about God? Are we encouraging our children to draw near to God? This is our responsibility, but it's our great privilege. And here's another thing. You children, some of you don't understand this or appreciate it. Why your parents homeschool you? Why they bring you to a church that teaches the great acts of God in history? Why do they do this? They do this because God told them to do it. And so your job is never to tempt them in this area with your recreations, with your entertainments, and your distractions that you put in your life and make it difficult for them to train you and teach you the great works of God. This is God's will for your parents and it's going to be God's will for you when you become a parent. And here's the problem. Some of you are going to miss out on the great teachings that you have in your home and within the churches that your parents have taught, taken you to because you won't pay attention. You won't, you won't sing the great praises of God when we sing together in congregational singing. You won't do it in public. You won't do it in private. So what are you going to give to your children? You're not going to teach them at all? Are you going to teach some vain imagination? A God of your own imagination? Some small God that you can put in and out of your pocket whenever you get ready to? Or are you going to train them and teach them about the greatness of God of the Scriptures? Here's the thing. Uh, in all their perfection, God is using your parents to guide you and direct you. So here's the thing. Instead of showing them ingratitude, instead of making their life difficult and tempting them in this area, how about you get on your knees and thank God for giving your parents like this? And why don't you get on your knees and just pray for them? Pray that God will give your parents wisdom. Pray that God would give them a desire and a passion to show the greatness of Jehovah to you. You see, when we talk about passing the greatness of God on from one generation to the next, this is not like trying to pass some sports skill on to you or some trade. This is instructions that has eternal value. And once again, we need to be passing this along to our children. There's got to be within our lives a great zeal and a great passion for passing on the knowledge of God to the next generation. And when our children see a sense of awe and reverence in our own lives concerning God, then they're going to get it. They're going to be able to pass this along to their children. Yeah, I remember your granddad. He used to tell me about the greatness of God. Let me tell you about it. That was what David was saying in Psalm 78. You see, when we... When we homeschool, we should be doing more than just giving the basic subjects, math, reading, grammar, history. All those things are important, but they pale in comparison. If we're missing out on life, if we're missing a huge, great opportunity, if we're not showing them the great works of our God. You see, if they don't know the great works of God, what can't they do? They can't praise Him for them. And so my prayer is that for my children, they will have a greater passion than I do for God. They will have a better understanding of His greatness than I do. I wish that they would pass down this to their children and that their children's children would far exceed them. And so as each generation goes on, our prayer should be that their faith grow stronger and stronger. Look at verse 5. Here's the key to it. 
David says, how is it that David can do all this? How is it that David knows so much about God and that he has this view of God? I mean, if you just walk into most churches today and you know your friends and family members that claim to be Christians, they don't do this, right? You may not be doing it either, but you know they don't do it. Why? It's not as though this is some groundbreaking revolutionary thing. I mean, this is as old as David. How is it that David has this revolutionary concept about training the next generation about the greatness of God and we're missing it? Why is that? Because we don't do verse 5. David does something that we will not do in the church. He says, I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on the want your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. David is committing himself to spreading the truth of God's word, not only to his generation, but to those that follow him. And David is looking to generations beyond himself. I mean, just look at what he says in verse 7. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. David wants them to eagerly utter, in other words, pour forth like a fountain about the goodness of God. And, and notice, David is not content with just trickling out the truth by drops. He wants the truth of God to gush forth. David wants the land to be filled with mouths who gush forth the truth of God's goodness. The land should be filled with grateful people who joyfully sing the praises and the goodness and the righteousness of their God. I mean, think about the churches where you have gone to and the congregation is singing loudly the praises of God. It's infectious. It is such a delight and a joy to be in such a place. And it'll cause you to enter in with them. It'll cause you to sing in with them because you resonate with that. But when you walk into a church where there's an evidence that there's just no life, there's apathy towards God, that spreads like a cancer as well. And it's infectious. There's nothing worse than when the people of God just trickle forth the praises of God. It should gush forth like fountains. And our prayer should be that our land would be filled with fountains gushing forth the truth of God and His goodness. What is the source of this desire and this commitment to tell others about the majesty of God? And it's found there in verse 5. I will meditate on your glorious splendor. This is the basis for our desire to proclaim the truth of God. We as a people of God must learn to meditate on the mighty and gracious works of our God. Now, when we talk about meditating, we're not talking about this Eastern views of meditation that's so prevalent out there. The Eastern view of meditation is just a emptying of the mind for mental health. But when the Bible talks to us about meditating, it's telling us to fill our minds with the greatness of God. Biblically speaking, meditation always has content. In other words, you're putting something into your mind. You're not emptying it out. An empty-headed person is what? That's a blockhead, right? Who wants to be an empty-headed person? Well, that is the basis of Eastern meditation. They're emptying their minds out. But a Christian should never want this. The Christian should always want a mind full of the goodness and the greatness of God. When you meditate, you're filling your mind with the perfections of God. God in the Bible has revealed many things about Himself to us. And when we meditate, we allow God to fill our minds with the majesty of Himself to us. And as you do this, you're going to be motivated you're going to be more intensely geared towards praising God. So here's the thing. If you ever come in here and you're unable to worship God, then I can tell that either you are in sin or you haven't been meditating upon it. It's one of the two. You see, if you come up in here while you know we're worshiping and you're scrolling through your phone, are you waiting for some important email and you're checking your emails throughout the worship service? If you're just checking your status and your update on your social media, that tells me there's a problem. That tells me you have not been meditating upon God because when you meditate upon the greatness of God, those things don't matter. They're not interesting to you. When this takes place in worship and we see the distractions, then there's good evidence you've not been meditating upon Jehovah. In addition, not to you know, when not meditating upon God, there's another reason why you may be struggling to praise God, and it's found over in, in Psalm one. Turn over there, Psalm one. 
So when you ask, what is the secret? What is the, 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 the secret to David in this multi-generational view of praising God and declaring the mighty acts of God from one generation to the next? It's meditation. It's meditating upon the great works of our God. In Psalm 1 we read, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And his law, he meditates, there's that word, day and night. And when this happens, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So if you're content to be in the presence of God, uh, I'm sorry, if you're, if, you're, if you're content, let me, let me flip it around and say it another way. If you're content to be in the presence and receive counsel from the ungodly, it's going to impact your praise. So who you hang out with, who you allow to uh, pour into your life is going to impact your praise. If you're struggling to praise God, then here's what I'd encourage you to do. Go back and look this week. Who did you keep company with? And did you meditate upon God on His Word? If you have been content to be with the ungodly, then you have not been feeding the motivation you need to praise Him. And also, if you've not been meditating upon the law of God, and the law of God is not your delight, then you will not have the proper motivation to praise Him. And this is important because the law of God reveals to us something about the character, the nature, the purity, the perfection of our God. But Psalm 1 teaches us what a truly blessed man looks like. Are you blessed? You look like this? Do you look like Psalm 1? You see, the truly blessed man separates himself from a lifestyle of sin. And what brings the greatest delight to a blessed man is meditating upon God and upon his law. And so when he does this, David says, you're going to grow and you're going to grow strong. You're going to grow strong and you're going to be productive like a tree that's planted by a river. You will always bear fruit. And whatever you do, he says, you'll prosper. And at the heart of all of this is meditation. As you read the Bible, let me encourage you to do this. As you read and study the Scriptures, do you ever stop and talk to yourself about what is this text saying to me about God? In what way is the text that I'm now reading? Now, I'm not talking about just going through this reading through the Bible program in a year, just kind of rush through it, I've done it, check the box and move it on. I'm talking about stopping and asking yourself questions. What does this text tell me about my God so that I might turn around and praise Him for it? As you read the Bible, talk to yourself. And as you do this, you're going to come to the place where David is. And listen, I get it. I understand what David is doing here. What he is saying sounds so foreign to many modern Christians. But why is it foreign to many modern Christians? It's because they're not doing what David was doing. When we don't meditate upon God, when we don't meditate upon His glorious splendor, His works then we're not going to have this great zeal and passion to praise Him. And we're certainly not going to be interested in telling the next generation. When you learn to meditate upon Him, you, you don't want to take your eyes off of Him. In other words, He's going to overwhelm you. He's going to consume you. But this meditation is the root of our praise. This is the root of our commitment to teach others about Him. And so this is a reminder to each and every one of us. If we're not meditating upon the great God of the Scriptures then we have absolutely nothing to teach our children. We have absolutely nothing to teach this generation that is lost and wandering around in the darkness. We have nothing to teach our friends. Do you get, do you understand how to get what David had? Meditate upon your Lord. Meditate upon the Word. Look at verse 8. He says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. He says there in verse 9, uh, the Lord is good to all and His tender mercies are over all of His works. So when David teaches us this great truth about the Scriptures, you know, he's not really bringing new revelation to the table, is he? I mean, if you just read through the Scriptures up until this point, this wouldn't be the first time you ever heard that God is gracious and full of compassion, that God is slow to anger and great in mercy and He's just good to all, right? When David teaches us this great truth about the Scriptures, this is not new revelation. What he's been doing is when he writes this psalm, he's showing you, I've been meditating upon God and this is what I learned about him. He took the word that he had access to and he put it to psalm. Turn over to uh, Exodus 34. I bet he was thinking about this when he wrote this, this psalm and wrote those verses about this psalm. Exodus 34. Exodus 34, look at verse 6. In 
And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving the iniquity and the transgression of sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. You see, David is teaching us how to meditate, isn't he? When he writes this in the Psalm 145, he's teaching us how to meditate. There are so many out there who want, if I could just get this new revelation from God. But David's not saying that's not how you draw closer to God. It's not looking for some new revelation. It's meditating upon the truth that God has given you. And this truth about God goes all the way back to Exodus. David is instructing us in this psalm to meditate upon God, but he also practices what he preaches, doesn't he? And he writes this verse, he's drawing in his mind his time that he spent in the Word, and he's put it to words, and this is how he's teaching the next generation. Now let's turn back to Psalm 145, look at verse 9. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all of his works. And so notice David teaches us this great truth. God's just good. And he's good to all. And, and this is why the unbeliever will be punished. Because God is good. They refuse to praise him. Even though he has been good to them, he has been merciful to them. The unbeliever gets to enjoy God's creation every day. He gets to enjoy the sunshine. He gets to enjoy the rain. He gets to just enjoy the same joys you have. The laughter of a child. But he won't praise him and he won't give him thanks. You see, when we refuse to praise him, then we act just like the unbeliever. And David wants us to meditate on this great truth so that we proclaim to others the goodness of our God. So when the unbeliever makes some slanderous comment about our God, then we need to remind them, God's not only merciful to us as believers, he's good to you too. He's good to all. And there's not one person who goes to hell who can say, you know, God was not good to me. You know, Jesus teaches us this truth as well. Remember Jesus said, God causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. And so while on earth, the unbeliever gets to experience the goodness and the kindness of God that they don't deserve. But here's the sobering truth. When they go to hell, they're never going to taste His goodness again. <clears throat> Understand that God's goodness is for now for the unbeliever. <clears throat> His goodness is to draw them to repentance. If they refuse to submit to Him, they will never taste His goodness, His compassion, His kindness ever again. And that's the reality we need to remind ourselves of because we have loved ones that are playing games with God then we need to remind them of this truth. God has been good to you even though you've not been good to Him. And if they don't repent, if they don't submit to Him, they're never going to know His kindness again. To die in unbelief is not something that we should take lightly. Now look at verse 10. All your works. And as I read this, I want to ask you, you ever talk like this? You know anybody in, in, in the church that talks like David's talking about, about to talk right now? Listen to this. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. I mean, this sounds just like the prophecy of Daniel. Turn over to Daniel 7 with me. And keep this in mind as we as we kind of explain this section here in Psalm 145. But in, in Daniel 7, look at verse 13. Daniel said, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in His kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Now this is a messianic in nature. This is talking about Christ. It's not talking about a second coming either. All this takes place when He comes down. Or not when He comes down, but when He goes up, referring to His ascension. At His ascension, God gives Him a kingdom. Now, in Psalm 145, here's what we are to do. We are to meditate on the perfection of God that's what motivates us. 
And we have to point out the obvious here. When he says that we are to do this, all your work shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. Now notice what he says here in verse 11. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power. You see, when we come to praise God for his power, his kingdom, his dominion, his rule, his reign, it has nothing to do with your feelings and has absolutely nothing to do with your circumstances. The focus has to be what is the focus there in verse 11. We're not to focus on ourselves. And if we're not to focus on ourselves, then what are we to focus on? The glory of your kingdom. The power of your kingdom. And we've got to pause now because when we talk about God, do we use this kind of language? In other words, when we talk about God, do we focus on his kingdom and his dominion? When we talk to our children, do we talk about the majesty, the glory of Christ's kingdom on earth? Do we talk about his mighty accomplishments, the mighty accomplishments of his kingdom as he is overthrowing the kingdom of darkness? Do we talk about the, the kingdom of Christ that is everlasting to everlasting? His kingdom will conquer all of his enemies. I mean, do we talk like this? Many Christians talk about the saviorhood of Christ. And there's nothing wrong with that. But unfortunately, many of them leave out the kingship of Christ. Christ does save us from our sins, but he is more than that. Christ comes to us, he saves us. Why? so that we might become servants in his kingdom. And as Christ's kingdom advances, it is reduced. You know, when, when you think about what Christ is doing, he is actually, he's actually reducing the world to order. That was Calvin's view. Grace liberates, grace frees, but the grace of God also reduces men to obedience. And so as fallen men in Adam, we are rebels. When God's grace comes upon us, He reduces us so that we're no longer rebels, but we're servants. And God's grace causes us to lay down our arms and stop and cease warring with Him. Christ as our King, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, He's going to put all of His enemies under His foot and He will reduce all rebels. He will reduce all rebellious work to order. That's why He saved us. And so, here's the thing. As we talk about the mighty works of God, have you explained and told your children the triumphs of God's grace in your life? That's one of the greatest mighty acts that you'll ever be able to talk about. It's how He took you as a rebel and caused you to lay down your arms and stop warring with Him and become His servant. Has God subdued you? And if He has, then tell those around you how He did it. This is how we pass the great works of God on to the next generation. Tell them how God reduced you to submission. So many in the church, unfortunately, cannot do this. Why? They've embraced a false gospel. And so they can't talk about how God has reduced them to order because they're still disorderly. They haven't brought their lives into order with God. They have not brought their families into order. They have not brought their marriages into order. Most of them are going to churches that are not in order. They haven't brought their businesses to order. Every area of their life is one of disorder. And just so we all understand here, we've not been saved to just live any kind of life we want to live, but rather we have been saved so that we submit to our King and we will spend the rest of our lives obeying Him. So, can you tell people of the triumph of God's grace in your life? Has He subdued you? Has He brought you to order? Can you personalize that story? Can you say He's my God and He's my King? He rules me. He reigns over me. Well, what we see here in this text is an everlasting kingdom that does not pass away and it can never be destroyed. The goal of the kingdom is a display of God's saving grace whereby he reduces sinners to submission and serve the living God. And so his desire is that people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation would be brought into his kingdom and bow before his kingship. So when we speak, we need to speak of the Lord Jesus Christ who rules and reigns. I mean, we got a lot to talk about, don't we? Also, do you see the sin of many churches who all over this area teach? Well, all you need to do is make a decision, try Jesus on for a little while, just try him as your Savior and see how you like it. That's not the God that, that David's talking about here. You don't try on Jesus like he's a shirt, and if it doesn't fit right, you just take it off and just throw it away. Jesus is the king. Well, we need to talk about the mighty king that we serve and we need to point people that they need to submit to Christ's universal reign.
I could talk about this one all night, but let me move on. Look at verse 14. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. And he says in verse 16, you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. What great imagery that we have here. Anytime one falls to the weight of this life, God says, I'll sustain you. I'll take care of you. And we have this, I mean, just look at the, the graciousness. and I mean, everything that God, that, that David is saying about God is true. Because now David's giving you great examples. He's saying, look, it's not that God just provides for us as believers. He says he provides for all. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. And the eyes of all look expectantly to you to give them their food in their due season. All of earth looks to God for provision. All creatures, all animals, all birds, everyone, men, we're dependent upon God for our continued existence. I mean, just look at the picture here. Is this how you think of God? Look at verse 16. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of the living, every living thing. Look at the picture there. The picture is that of a benevolent God who is putting his hand out to personally feed us. It points to his personal care. You see, he's not some faraway removed deity. He is a good God that is involved with his creation to take care of them and provide for them. That includes us. He feeds us. And for that, we should be grateful. We should be willing to praise his name. But here's the thing. You're not going to praise him if you don't do what David does. You don't meditate upon him. You don't know about everything he's doing for you. You can't praise him. You can't thank him for that area. Look at verse 17. I encourage y'all, you need to memorize this text. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways, gracious in all of his works. No matter what happens to you, you need to preach this verse to yourself. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways and kind in all of his works. There's never in a time, any kind of any any time in your life where God has not been righteous and kind to you, no matter what your circumstances are. He is righteous and kind. He is gracious. In other words, God has never done any one of us in here wrong. And you need to learn to meditate upon God. You need to learn to put this verse in your heart so that you don't sin against Him. Always remember, God has never made a mistake in your life. He never does anything that is out of His character. And so, because He's a righteous God, everything He does is righteous. And so David teaches us another vital truth. In verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. In other words, he's always near. He's never far from you. When we call out to him in truth, he's right there. But we've got to call out upon his truth. This means we're not calling out to him in some kind of hypocrisy. We need to be in alignment with his will when we call out to him and cry out to him. But once again, if you're not meditating upon his word, you, you wouldn't know. In other words... Hannah and I were talking about this this morning. How do you know when you're being deceived? How do you know when you're buying a lie? Only when you know the truth. As you meditate upon God's word, you will know the truth, and from that truth, you will be able to cry out to him in accordance with his truth, and he says, I'm not far from you. Verse 19. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. Now when you read that verse, he will fulfill the desire. That's just not some open checkbook. Whatever it is you want, I want a million dollars, so I get it, right? That's not what that text is saying, is it? He says, notice, he will fulfill the desire of those who fear it. That's the qualifier. Do you fear God? If you don't fear God, then don't expect Him to give you your desires. Why? Because your desires are not in alignment with His desires. Those who fear God have their desires in alignment with His because they know His desire because they fear it. If you fear the Lord, then your desires are going to be His desires that He's given to you. When you fear Him, it says He will satisfy your desires, the desires of your heart. He'll hear you. He'll hear your cries. He'll save you. Look at verse 20. The Lord... This is how God deals with every people, every person. The Lord preserves all who love him, but the wicked he'll destroy. Notice here that those that fear God, they're going to love God. 
And those that love God, God says, I will keep you, I will preserve you, I will protect you. This is a voluntary love towards God that all believers have. We gladly submit to him because he's a good God. And turn over to Jude. Jude teaches, kind of builds on this truth over here. Now remember the, the issue in the book of Jude is that you have these apostates within the church. And um, Jude says in verse 1, a Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to all those who are loved by God the Father and preserved or kept for Jesus Christ. And then look down there at verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He's talking to the believers there. He's talking to those who are loved by God who are being preserved or kept for Jesus Christ. And he's telling you the same thing David is telling you. He's able to keep you from stumbling. He's able to present you faultless and blameless before his glory. This is how God deals with those that love him. But this verse also teaches us what God does to the wicked. God keeps those that love him, but it says he destroys the wicked. The wicked describes all those who refuse to put their trust in him, those who refuse to trust in his Messiah. We tend to think of the wicked as, you know, the murderer, the rapist, the thieves. And they are wicked, don't get me wrong. But it's more than that. There's plenty of people who live peaceable, quote, good lives. But they are wicked. Why? Because they refuse to submit to Christ's kingship. They refuse to submit to his dominion. They refuse to bring order into their lives where God has given them order. And God says they're wicked. They're not good. Don't be fooled by this. This is the problem. Uh, we've been uh, deceived and duped in our land to this idea we have to just be polite to everyone and we don't want to stir any ways or cause any ruffles. But when it comes to this issue, there's a lot of people we know that uh, have not put order within their life. They have not submitted their lives and brought themselves under the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're just playing games. We need to understand this. The Lord preserves, the Lord keeps all who love him. And if you love me, Christ says, you will do what? You're going to keep my commandments. But he has a message to the wicked. I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to destroy you. And so... Why is it wicked when we say that if you don't have your life in order under the dominion and lordship of the Lord, you know, under the lordship of Christ? It, it's just we have to remind ourselves of this: the goodness of God is leading all men to repent and turn to Christ as Lord and King. And if the goodness of God has not moved you to turn to Christ, then the Bible says you are a wicked person. So God's going to deal with you in one or two ways. If you love him, he's going to keep you, he's going to preserve you, he's going to present you faultless before his glory. If you're wicked, in other words, self-will, uh, governed by unbelief, there's just your whole life is one moment of ingratitude after another, you won't praise him, then God says, I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to destroy you. All the goodness you enjoy, you better, you better enjoy it now because once you enter into eternity, I'm done being good, kind, merciful, patient, long-suffering with you. You will taste my wrath for all eternity. But notice how the psalm is. Verse 21. My mouth shall speak of the praise, speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. Well, this psalm ends like it begins with praise. My mouth shall speak praises of the Lord. Why will his mouth speak praise of the Lord? Because he's been meditating upon his God. He's been doing what the modern church refuses to do. And because they refuse to do it, they have nothing to praise. They can't pass on the mighty works from one generation to the next. Why? They don't know him. Let me ask you, those of you who are my age and older, did your parents pass down the mighty acts of God to you? Did they praise the Lord of the Scriptures with you? Why not? Don't pass that curse to your children. <clears throat> it is a curse to them if we do not proclaim the mighty works of God to them so that they might praise God. And then David ends this great psalm with a prophecy. All flesh will bless his holy name. These prophecies like this are all throughout the Old Testament. I mean, Isaiah 2, when we looked at Isaiah 2, where we read that all will flow into Zion, all, all nations are going to flow into Zion to worship God. <coughs> the psalm, plus many of these prophecies, teach us that we have a great future with our God. And so this prophecy is tied to this psalm. How is this prophecy fulfilled? 
as we teach generation to generation these great truths about our God, all flesh will come to know and bless the Lord. Go back. I, I talk about this all the time, but I want to keep talking about it to hit you like it hits me. Trace your ancestry back as far as you can go. Where were they 2,000 years ago? Most of your ancestors were in darkness, steeped in paganism. And somewhere along the way, you got introduced to this great God. Now, if it was passed to you, onto you by your parents, or someone else has come and told you about the goodness and greatness of God, and now you have the opportunity to pass it on to your children. How does this psalm get fulfilled? Every tribe, tongue, and nation will come under the dominion of Christ. All flesh will bless His holy name forever and ever. How does it take place? David just told you. As you meditate upon the great works of God, you tell it to the next generation. You praise Him for it. And we want our land, this should be our prayer this evening, that our land is filled with people who gush forth like fountains the praises of our God. That's the beauty of this song. And we get to be part of it as we get to tell one generation to the next the splendor, the majesty, the goodness, the long-suffering, the mercy, the fact that our God is good to all people. On and on and on this, this text goes. It tells us that we should be telling others about the same thing David is telling us. And you can know it. And you can know it by meditating upon God's Word. And so may God grant us the grace to have a hunger, have a thirst, to desire His Word, to be uh, always desiring to meditate upon His Word so that we might learn to praise His name. Father, we thank You so much for this time and Your Word. We ask that You would uh, hide it deep within our hearts so that we might not forget this evening. We might not forget Your expectations that You have that we would pass from one generation to the next, uh, the glory and the majesty and the splendor of You. Father, help us to see you in all your glory as you reveal yourself to us in your word. May we, we find you in your splendor and your glory. We see the Lord Jesus Christ who is, who is just perfection personified. Father, help us to come to know the God of David where you become our God and our King. We pray that you would continue to help us find order within our lives and that we might bring everything under your dominion. And Lord... We pray that even for tomorrow evening, as we prepare to worship your great acts in history, uh, our children would get excited about what they hear and what you did in, in, in Scotland. And so, Father, we just pray for that time. We pray that you prepare the hearts of, of everyone that would be there, especially our young ones, so they would have a zeal and a passion to know the mighty works of our God so they might pass it down to their children. And our prayer for our children is that they would have a deeper hunger and thirst, that they would have a greater sense of adoration, and, and just a sense of awe greater than we do and that they might pass that on to their children. So Father, we ask that you prepare our children so that they might prepare theirs. And we ask all this in Christ's name.